Welcome. We are so excited to have you all here. You're going to have quite the experience. Uh, as we move into the final event for the spring semester of the Menard Family Lecture Series, thanks to Dr. Steve Goldman and Donna Clark, who have worked hard to put these on uh, during the year. We're pleased to have you here. I'm hoping as we move into the Kentucky Derby season that you all are placing your trifecta bets and that you all win on your horses. But today, you will win a trifecta with our three guests, right? So I'm not Steve Goldman. I'm his fillion. I'm the better looking version of Dr. Goldman. The one with hair. <laughs> the one with hair. Okay. I'm Vernon Foster. I'm the senior executive director here in the College of Business and also the assistant dean over our graduate program. So we'll be asking for you to consider the MBA program. And by the time you learn that these illustrious three all have their MBA from the University of Louisville, you're going to be wanting to go do the same thing. So please see me after we finish. So, but before I do that, there's housekeeping. I have a couple of things to cover. When you came in, you were handed a survey. Please complete that and leave it on the tables at the back when you leave. If you are here for extra credit or as part of a reading group, you must complete the survey with your name, class numbers, and professor's name to get credit. If you're just here because you're like me, you want to hear where the bourbon industry is headed and the impact it has on certainly the Commonwealth of Kentucky, then still fill out the survey because we use those surveys to help make our programming better for you each time. And so we'll get back to you on any questions that you have uh, that you put on the survey. So with that, let me start with the trifecta. And that is the introduction of our three Cardinals. So I'm honored and privileged to get to introduce each one of them. They represent some of the largest and most prominent spirits companies in the world. You are in for a delightful treat. Uh, unfortunately, you're not allowed to have any of the treat that's behind them on the table, though. I know. I try to get them to give everyone out a sample. All right. We'll start with Robinson Brown. He's a fifth generation family employee at Brown Foreman Corporation, a Louisville, Kentucky based global wine and spirits company. Brown Foreman is one of the largest American owned spirit and wine companies and among the top 10 global spirits businesses. Robinson has spent the last 20 years in the wine and spirits industry, serving in various sales and marketing leadership roles, both domestically and internationally. And I think you talked about Dubai and Spain, half the world, Amsterdam. Okay. And then most recently, Robinson was appointed as the VP Managing Director for the Emerging Business Group within Brown Foreman, which is an incubator business unit targeting new to world and early stage spirits brands. In addition, he is a member of the company's Responsibilities and Rights Committee and serves on the Brown Family Brown Foreman Shareholders Committee. Robinson carries great passions toward emerging markets and early stage brands with a lens toward entrepreneurship and helping support Brown Foreman and the Brown family to continue building for decades and centuries ahead. Robinson holds a degree from the University of Kentucky, but more importantly, a University of Louisville Entrepreneurship and Innovation MBA. Welcome, Robinson. All right, moving on to Lindsay Biggie currently serves as the Director of Commercial Planning. So this is Lindsay on the end, in case you haven't figured this out, right? So, Director of Commercial Planning and Field Activation for Angels Envy. In this role, Lindsay oversees the commercial sales and advocacy functions and is responsible for commercializing, commercializing the Angels Envy brand across North America and setting long-term strategies to position the brand with a solid foundation for growth. Lindsay joined Angels Envy in November 2021 after spending six and a half years with the brand's parent company, Bacardi USA, in a variety of sales leadership roles. And I have to do a little plug for the Angels Envy at LNN Stadium. If you haven't gone and seen that on the backside where the trains are, you're in for a treat. You need to go check out that facility. Prior to joining Bacardi, Lindsay worked at the Kellogg Company for nine years on the National Account Sales Team. Lindsay is the president and co-founder of the Fight Foundation, a local charity she started alongside her husband to raise awareness and funding for childhood cancer research. Ask her why. She earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Xavier University and a professional MBA from the Cardinals. 
University of Louisville, a born and raised Kentuckian. Lindsay lives just south of Louisville with her husband and her two one-year-old puppies, Luna and Molly. Welcome, Lindsay. Got to get the Cardinals in. Are you not Cardinals? All of you not Cardinals? Well, then you need to see me because we need to convert you. And then, of course, Ricardo Delgado. Ricardo is currently the matuation director for JBBD Company a, at Bean Suntory. He started his career in Bean Suntory in 2007, working for Casa Salsa as a distillery process engineer, working to improve processes, efficiencies, and mapping the distillation process. Later, Ricardo moved to operations, and in 2011, he had the opportunity to move from Mexico and the Casa Salsa team to Kentucky to join the North America Operational Excellence Team as a central change agent. A central change agent, he had the opportunity to work through most, throughout most of Beam Suntory's North America plants, improving the operational efficiencies and leading the initiatives for the lean management systems. In 2017, he went back to operations and was given the challenge to improve the newest dumping floor at Booker No plant to meet increased demand and support the bulk shipments of bourbon to Kentucky bottling plants and exports markets in Spain and Japan. At this point, his path to maturation was set from overseeing dumping and bulk shipments for a year and ultimately all barrel warehousing operations for Claremont and Booker No. He earned a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Guadalajara, and then a tequila specialist degree, a leadership degree, a black belt Lean Six Sigma certification, and best of all, then an executive MBA, <laughs> no card, from our joint program of the University of Kentucky and University of Louisville, and recently completed, on top of all of this education, a global leadership development program with Suntory University. They're not going to be a competitor of ours, are they? Not yet. Not yet. No, not yet. <laughs> Jeff, we talk about all the competitors coming into the market. Ricardo lives in Bardstown, Kentucky with his wife from 15 years, Eva, and two children, Diana and Eric. He enjoys traveling, reading, coaching his children's sports, and grilling, and maybe some distilled spirits, let's hope. <laughs> if anyone knows what the future of bourbon industry looks like, these pre three people will, so Stephen. Thank you, Vernon. So, you know, we're, we're having this, this panel because Kentucky produces 95% of all bourbon. And uh, in 2009, there were only 19 distillery, distilling establishments in Kentucky. And by 2021, there were 95 establishments. So I thought it'd be really important to look at this growth and look at what the future of the bourbon industry is, even though it seems a little odd because I've never drank bourbon. <laughs> that I didn't finish. <laughs> but, uh, so, so I'm going to ask each of them to, to talk a little bit about what their outlook is for the bourbon industry in the future, and then ask a few more questions, and we'll talk for a while, and then we'll have questions from the audience. So whoever wants to start, I'm fine. What's, what's your outlook, or your company's outlook for the industry? And talk a little bit about your company. Lindsay, you want to start? Uh, we'll get started, sure. So as Vernon said, I work for Angels NV. Our, our distillery and brand home is in downtown Louisville. We were the first fully functioning distillery in a post-prohibition era in downtown Louisville. So very excited to lead the revitalization of Whiskey Row. I think the, uh, the future of bourbon cannot be understated how bright it is. Obviously, with an aged product, you have to do planning well in advance. And we were just looking at our strat plan through the year 2050 and planning just how much liquid we need to produce and start to mature in order to meet the demand that is just going to continue to rise for the future. As you think about the economic impact for Kentucky, last year alone, there were $2.1 billion invested in infrastructure from companies and um, their dis distilleries, the Rick houses, all of the production that goes in to making bourbon and so it's a big bet for all of these companies uh, to be able to put that much money behind it and support the economy of Kentucky so future is bright I think it, it truly cannot be understated how much upside we still have in the bourbon industry okay. yeah <clears throat> Ricardo Delgado so work for Beam Centauri uh, like Lindsay saying the growth of bourbon is tremendous uh, we, we've been expansion after expansion after expansion. 
every year just building, you all probably see as uh, <laughs> you drive through Kentucky, more and more warehouses just pop up uh, on the roads. Uh, we're investing 30 to $40 million every year uh, in more maturation, in more uh, warehousing space. Uh, our products, uh, again, it's just selling and selling. Uh, the key to this is what, what we're shifting or what we want to be is in, in the premium sector. So we're premiumizing, and this is what you'll see on the expressions. It's not um, just the value brand. It's, it's you're, you're starting to see different packages, different innovations, different products, LTOs, um, limited time offers uh, for those who don't know LTO. Um, but it's, it's just catching on, on the packaging, on the finish, on the year. So now you see expressions before you didn't see 12-year-olds, uh, 15-year-olds, 18-year-olds uh, in bourbon, and now you're seeing all that. So I think for, for us and, and the industry, it's all about premiumizing, and growth continues to be here. So it's great for Kentucky. It's great for the industry, for, for the bourbon industry. Thank you. Uh, echo both what they have both said here. I think, um, you know, one comment I would add to, if, if you look at bourbon whiskey in Kentucky and you look at exports internationally, so I spent the last seven years overseas, so I spent a lot of time there, you know, bourbon whiskey for a long time was very underdeveloped uh, outside of the United States. It was scotch whiskey. So if you, if you, in fact, if you say whiskey to a lot of people in Asia, Latin America, they would assume scotch. And so we have worked as an industry very hard on both education and also getting, um, I would say legal drinking age younger consumers as they're on their spirits journey across the world, actually bourbon and whiskey is where they're starting now. They're not going to categories like scotch. They're not going to vodka. They're very uh, intrigued by this space. And so we're really excited about it. We've spent over a billion dollars in the last nine years on investments in warehousing. Uh, Cooper, we have a cooperage, it's actually two cooperages now. We actually make our own barrels. And we really believe that this is a fundamental shift over the next two to three decades at the very minimum. And I will say too, um, you know, the bourbon industry, it, it was big for a long time, but from 1971 until 2011, it was in decline. Brown spirits were not in vogue. White spirits were very popular. And we're just, we believe, just starting to see a substantial foundation for growth, but not just in the US, all over the world. So what's the demographics that's driving this growth? I always had this hypothesis. It was the old people like me, we, we don't want to drink beer anymore, so we're spending more money on, on bourbon, but I'm not sure that's the case. I think it's, it's certainly trending in a different direction. <laughs> uh, first of all, from a gender perspective, more females and women are getting into the bourbon uh, industry and the category, learning more about it. Um, I think younger as well uh, trending. And so I think between those two things, women and a younger generation, it's certainly shifting the dynamics of what we've been used to. Um, feel free to add on if you all see. Yeah, I think um, for all of it, there's, there's different expressions. There's products for everyone. Uh, you have the lower proofs that uh, are more enticing for younger, uh, for women, for if you don't like the strong spirit. But there's also the expressions that are 120 proof uh, that is also um, kind of leading towards that other, other um, population that would like a, a stronger, more, more body in, in, in the spirit. Uh, and then you have all the flavoring, so everything, <laughs> cocktails and uh, all the expressions that, that are pretty much suitable for um, a very broad uh, consumer base. Yeah, and I can, I can add just, um, and you just touched on this too, there's, so first with Gen Z and millennials in general, alcohol consumption is down versus Gen X. However, they're drinking higher quality, so it's quality over quantity, which puts our portfolios in a really great space. So they're, they're willing to pay more. They want to explore and experiment, and, and more so moving away from beer. So beer, uh, nothing against beer, but beer has had a huge advantage in the last 60 to 70 years, really since Prohibition came, um, was ended in 1933. They were the market share leader of total beverage alcohol. This year was the first year, I think in recorded history, that spirits in the United States has overtaken beer. And in particular, it is coming from bourbon, whiskey, and tequila. We won't talk about tequila today. So, um, but but for, for Gen Z and millennials in particular, you know, lower lower alcohol content and no low as well. That's a really popular trend right now. And so, there's different ways that we're able to engage with different um, um, drinkers on their journey, whether they're having an opportunity to try something that's higher proof, lower proof, and somewhere in between. 
So you'll see a lot of innovation in that space in the years ahead. Yeah, so, so what are these innovations? What, what are the new types of product that you guys are coming out with? We'll go with this. We'll start on you. Okay, yeah, I'm happy to start. So um, I'll st let, me, let me touch on a space that's not us first. Heineken beer. We've all heard of Heineken, right? They came out. They were one of the first to actually introduce a zero alcohol beer. It was about five years ago. It is now close to 15% of their global sales. And so they were an excellent, they, they established that there is a, a hunger and a desire for people who still drink alcohol, but in many occasions when they're going out, maybe they want to have one drink. They don't want to, they don't want to have two or three. And so it gave them the opportunity to be able to exchange you know, both, I'll say, full strength products with uh, something that has either completely is devoid of alcohol or at a lower space. Our company right now, we are looking candidly very closely at established companies that exist today. It's still a relatively small space, but there are spirit businesses that exist that have zero alcohol that you can buy that have like Manhattans and old fashions that you can pour over ice and it tastes identical to something that has alcohol in it, but it has, not, it has zero alcohol whatsoever. And so we're kind of earlier in our journey in the space. I don't think you will see Brown Foreman take our existing brands like a Old Forester or Woodford Reserve and remove alcohol. But what you may see is other brands that come out of our portfolio in that space, because we think it's really important, especially as the next two generations are coming into the drinking space. Um, for us, we have expressions that, I mean, we've never tested before, so toasted uh, finishes. So we have, can we say names? Yeah. Uh, basil Hayden toast <laughs> that, is, that is finished. Uh, it's a different expression. It's a brown rice. Uh, finishing a toasted barrel, which in the past it was all char four barrels. Uh, you start seeing some smoked barrels as well. So you, again, Basil Hayden, subtle smoke. Uh, we have finishes in wine and sherry casks, similar to Angel's Envy. Um, also, uh, we have like a product that is, is convenience. You all, COVID, COVID hit and everybody started making cocktails at home. And it's like, I don't know how to make a cocktail. So we have uh, convenience as well. So it's you know, pre-made margarita, all the flavoring, natural flavors. And uh, again, people are trending towards more natural than, than artificial or um, just a, a cheaper version. But it's, it's premium spirits, premium cocktails uh, that is ready to serve. So just open, pour it over ice, the old fashions, the um, margaritas, all different expressions. Uh, we were talking before we started about a a coffee uh, finish or drink um, in, in this pre-made cocktail that, again, it's, it's something that I would probably not try it. But now <laughs> that it's there, it's like, well, maybe I'll try it. <laughs> it's so convenient that just pour it and they tell you how to do it. So uh, I think all of that is, is opening uh, different options. Yeah, and for Angel's Envy, our innovation strategy is rooted in our motto of always finished, never done. So our entire portfolio of bourbon and rye whiskeys are always finished in a secondary barrel. So our core Angel's Envy is finished in a port wine cask. Our rye is finished in a Caribbean rum cask. And so when we introduce innovation, it's those limited time offerings that are highly desirable, very collectible from consumers. We have one in the back, our Angel's Envy rye ice cider. This came came out last year, sold out in seven minutes at our brand home. So these are very highly coveted, unique releases. That's another big trend in bourbon right now is the collectability, kind of that status symbol of see what I have at my bar, want to be able to introduce that to your friends. Um, and I think that's, that's really where we are honing in on with our innovation, along with a single barrel program. So this is another area that a lot of brands are investing in. I know Woodford Reserve, for example, are producing more single barrels than they ever have even before COVID. Within Angel's Envy, we have ramped up our single barrel uh, program extensively over the last couple of years. And this is another way for consumers to get their hands on a truly one of a kind experience. It, the, the product comes from one single barrel, so you will never taste another liquid that is quite like that due to the differences and variances across barrels. So I think single barrel program is another way that bourbon continues to innovate. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of stores now that are having their, they, oh, yeah. they choose barrels and, and you, you get a big difference because mm -hmm. people come in and they taste it. And my guess is those bourbons are usually a little sweeter because most of us like things that are sweeter. So you have me taste five bourbons, I'll probably pick the sweeter one. It depends. Do you think that's the case? I mean, it does depend <laughs> on the drinkers. But. 
usually they come in and say, what's the highest proof that I can get? And that's the one that I want. <laughs> it's the highest proof and the oldest one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You pick five barrels and, and you'll see that normally they tend to go towards the oldest and the highest proof. Huh. Mm -hmm. nice. can, I, can I have one more comment yeah. just on yeah. trends here? Um, and this is a big opportunity for Kentucky. So uh, how many of you have heard of, whether you drink it or not, have heard of High Noon? Okay, or ready, there we go. So ready to drinks or RTDs is a relatively new, um, it really started a couple years before COVID, but during COVID it took off rapidly. And so convenience has become, it's a game, since COVID, convenience has become a critical factor for consumers. They wanna be able to enjoy, just like we talked about uh, on the rocks, um, they wanna be able to enjoy drinks that they can take with them wherever they wanna go, whether it's at large events, et cetera. And so the RTD category has exploded. Well, if you look at the data for the next five years, number one, it's coming from beer. It's taking directly from the beer category. Number two, if you look at where is the growth gonna come from in the next five years, bourbon whiskey is projected to be one of the fastest pre-mixed RTD categories. And this is not just US, this is globally. And so as we work together and other companies to innovate in the space, it's gonna be a great way to introduce uh, new consumers to, to our products in Kentucky the way we want it to taste too. So whether it's, you know, I'll use a, a name, Jack and Coke from the South, it could be a Jim Beam product. You know, we want to make sure that they can try it the way that we design it to be tasted and to, and to, be, to be consumed. And that has never been possible since the industry was ever formed, you know, centuries ago. So it's a huge space for us ahead. So the innovation is important. If you talk about the beer industry, the, the big three macro producers have really been hurting because consum consumers have gone to craft brewing, and that's gone up from 5% to 20%, and consumption of beer has gone down, and it's all come out of, out of Bud and Miller and Coors and so forth. And so this innovation is important for them because they didn't innovate. And same with you guys, it's, people aren't just drinking bourbon, they want bourbon with this or that, or bourbon that's been flavored. But how do you, how do you figure out these innovations? Because you've got to age this bourbon. So should we put it in this barrel or not, and you wait seven years to figure it out? How do you do that? Well, I'll, I'll start yeah. with this one. Okay, please. <laughs> so sometimes it, it is the the market study. What 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 are the trends? What are the other, what is the market actually asking for? But then there's other opportunities where you have surplus. When you have more of of an expression, and then you start innovating in that in that environment of oh, we have this overage liquid that hey, why don't we do this overage expression? that we never thought we could have. Uh, again, being the industry at a, at a certain age, and again, we started doing these 12, 15 year old expressions that, you know, it's been bourbon that has been kind of laying there for a longer time, um, that we can use that as an advantage. But the other ones is what is the trend and, and what's the market asking? And looking at the sales, uh, we have similar, a 12 year plan that we review every year and extrapolate. So, again, when you're planning for for long aging, it's it's a big margin of error. So you don't want to be short, but you also don't want to be way over because now you're <laughs> utilizing a lot of space, a lot of capital asset that's that you're not moving. Uh, so this is where where that innovation comes in play as well. Anybody else want to comment? I think that's well said. Definitely your area of expertise yeah, yeah, yeah. here. <laughs> so if if one of the students here wants to get a job in the bourbon industry, mm -hmm. and it's not just working for your companies, but there's a whole supply chain. Yeah. And so where all, could, where all might they look? So I can speak to this from a sales perspective if you wanted to get in the industry on that side of the business. So if you're not familiar with it, all alcohol goes through a three-tier system. And this was something that was put in place by the government after prohibition. and. Suppliers sell to distributors who sell to retailers. So technically, we don't directly sell any of our product to a Kroger or a Total Wine store. Everything goes through that distributor network. So it's very important to know that nuance within the industry because that's an entire another level of jobs that are out there and a great place to get started in the industry. Um, our Southern Glaciers Wine and Spirits is our, our, our distributor across the country. Um, they have a lot of great jobs that work directly with suppliers to help sell our products into retailers. So I, 
I always say that that's a great place to start, especially from an entry level perspective, because they have so many more people on their team, so many more job opportunities across the country. Um, otherwise, I would say learn as much as you can. Being here in this room is a great place to start, soaking up the knowledge from people who've been in the business network. I, I never pass up the opportunity to talk to a student or anyone who's interested in getting into the business and giving them my advice uh, to help them get there. So I think network, um, just do some job searching, see what opportunities are out there, but don't neglect the three-tier system with both the distributor and the supplier side as well. I can touch on, I'll hit on finance and marketing, I think. So uh, for any of you that are studying any of those disciplines, first off, the marketing function has dramatically revolutionized in the last five to six years. And so we used to reference part of marketing as, quote, digital marketing. That's all marketing is at this point in terms of a lot of the how, in terms of what we're speaking to consumers. And this has actually made us, uh, candidly, looking at uh, younger, uh, just recently graduated students who focus in that area that we want to be able to bring on who, frankly, live in the space of the consumers that we're talking to. And it's still pretty new for Brown Foreman. I mean, we've, we've caught up a lot. COVID actually had us catch up a lot faster, I think, for a lot of companies. But I would encourage you all, if there's interest there, we have internships every single summer. We have internships at times during the during semesters that you can do through this, I think, in some cases, through this program here. Um, but it's something you can go straight into. And then from a, a finance side especially, and I'll just speak for Brown Foreman, you know, we're a... Uh, we, we joke we're, we're a brand company, but I feel like we're more of a finance company at heart, to be, to be frank with you. We really value bringing in leaders who can come in and grow. And we have a lot of University of Louisville graduates that work for the company that have come in that space. And then the one thing I'll say that actually will open doors for you too. So if you come in through marketing, you come in through finance or through commercial, um, we, we move people around a lot. So you may, so I'm, I'm an example of this. You, know, you may find you enjoy one area, but then you grow in leadership. And then all of a sudden, you move into a completely different function in your life five, seven years into working at the company. And we really value kind of cross-functional experience as, as you grow in your career. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. Um, for, I'll talk about the brands and, and the heritage that we have. We have industries that are 200 years old or more, 100 years old. But when you look in supply chain, uh, we have projects. We call them seed to sip. Uh, so from grain to sip. And then our partners, we don't have cooperages, but as we partner with the cooperage side, it's from acorn to sip. So in order to have a, a oak tree that is uh, a white oak, in order to, to make barrels, you have to eat or grow 60 to 100 years. And we only get, on average, like three barrels per oak tree. So you can imagine how massive the forestry, sustainability, uh, and, and the cooperage side if you look at the next container, the glass industry, it's another massive industry that is more than 100 years old um, and everything that goes with it. And that, those are just the containers to hold the, the, the great liquids that we have behind us. Um, and then all the, the operation supply chain is it, it just unlimited. Um, as well, my, my experience, you know, I started in, in, in engineering, uh, went to continuous improvement operations um, it, it just opens up a lot, um, also with all the products that we have, uh, international and global is, is, is the limit. Um, one thing you mentioned was digital transformation. I think that's also key that uh, everything is through your, through your cell phone, uh, all the applications, you want to look at a product, go online, uh, download this app, download that app. So, digital transformation is going to be key for, for the future. So I know there's some challenges in the bourbon industry, and I know during COVID, at least for the whiskey in, in Europe, they were having problems finding bottles. And I don't know if you, if you guys experienced that problem also, but is there a problem there? And also with barrels, given the increased demand for, for bourbon, is it hard to get barrels because there's not enough trees? Anybody want to hit touch on, on the bottles part? Do you want to do? Yeah, go ahead. I'll just say, I, I think, look, it, as you all know, when supply chain became an issue for all, pretty much all companies around the world, you had issues where China would have a bunch of containers sitting in one space, but it wasn't coming to the US. And we would literally have, at least in our company, we would have issues where we'd have an extra three to four months before we could get something shipped internationally or even domestically, where there's issues with train and rail systems. You couldn't get, you know, there wasn't enough truck drivers. I mean, it was just happening all at once. In glass in particular, 
Brown Foreman learned a lot in the last three or four years. You know, we have um, long-term partnerships with uh, glassmakers. I won't name their names. They're wonderful. But we were over-indexed on one partner. And it was a major mistake. So you talk about risk management. You talk about trying to diversify and have suppliers that you work with. We were not diversified. And so in the case, and I'll use Jack Daniels as an example, a big global brand, we had issues, in, and I was over these countries, we would be out of stock for three or four months on the shelf because of the fact that we were in a situation where we were not able to get enough glass to meet demand. And so a learning for us, and you talk about agility, um, we quickly were able to reprioritize and diversify having glass that's in Europe, glass that's in the United States. Uh, we even shifted bottling lines from just in Lynchburg, Tennessee. We have bottling now actually over in the UK, it's still all made in Lynchburg, but those were big taboos for our company. Like you would never even talk about something like that five years ago. And what has happened since COVID is, I think for all companies, we're all thinking differently now about how to make sure that we can get our inventory and our goods to the consumer at the right time, at the right moment. And so that was a big learning for us. Uh, it, and by the way, at a time when I think many of you may know, when everyone was at home, demand was increasing actually for, for spirits. It wasn't going down. So it was, a, it was an unusual time for trying to predict how to meet the need. Yeah, a little bit on, on the glass, we, we experienced exactly the same thing. Uh, we started shifting <laughs> from glass to PET. Um, again, during COVID, it was a, a massive learning. You know, bars, restaurants are closed, so their expression is like a liter bottle 750. Uh, what we started seeing tremendous growth was in the 175. So we were not ready for that. And again, we, we started sourcing different, different plants and uh, just to try to get the glass and be able to, to meet this demand. Uh, but yeah, it, we all thought it was gonna come down, but it was actually on, in a growth, uh, but just it shifted from sizes, from smaller sizes to bigger sizes. Uh, luckily on the barrel side, uh, this, there's a lot of work, it's, it's, it's tremendous, because I didn't know all of this, and when I first, th that was one of my first questions, is it sustainable uh, to the growth that we have? And the answer was yes, uh, so, <laughs> so far. Yeah. Um, so the answer was yes, and there's organizations that have been working on this for more than 50 years. Uh, so we, we see this growth right now, but they've been working on this for a long, long time. Uh, talking about career opportunities and forestry and, and sustainability of, of our brands and, and products, um, the forestry side, uh, all this work and, and sourcing different, different forests and uh, actually maintaining the forest to a certain species is something I didn't know that uh, you can dedicate certain acreage to say, okay, we want white oak, so you pretty much trim all the other species to kind of make sure that that populates. Uh, so again, it, it's tremendous work that has been done there, uh, and I think we're, we're in a good spot for, for the years to come. Yeah. I would echo the exact same thing on glass. I'm glad to hear we're not the only ones that uh, that was a challenge. I know last year when we were looking at our sales forecast for the upcoming fiscal year and I'm meeting with the production director and I said, this is the volume we need. Can you all deliver that? And they said, the only risk to the plan is glass. If we can't get our glass in, otherwise from a production standpoint, we have the liquid, we have the bottling line capacity, we have the people in place, uh, but it was just glass. And so I think that w that seems to be uh, an industry challenge during, during COVID and uh, continuing forward a little bit, but seems to be getting to be in a much better spot nowadays. So, so how big is overseas in the bourbon industry? And and when you ship product, do you just ship containers full of, of bourbon and bottle it overseas because it's less costly, or do you just ship bottles and which, how do you do that? I'll take that one. Mm -hmm. um, for, for our export, uh, we have roughly maybe 50% that goes overseas. Uh, we have bottling plants in Spain that take care of Europe and all that area, EMEA. And we also have bottling in Japan that takes care of that other area. Uh, but we ship uh, bulk because it's high proof. It's you know less water. You're not shipping 80 proof product. You're shipping 135 proof, 420. Um, sorry, 120 proof. Uh, but also the weight of glass and, and taxes and everything that goes in a finished case product is different than when you ship uh, bulk. Yeah, I just added. Same time. Uh, I'll have to reference Jack Daniel, sorry, but just because it's, it's only okay. pairs I can use. But yeah, about, about half of our sales international. Um, up until COVID, everything was shipped already pre-bottled, pre-packaged in Lynchburg, Tennessee. 
Post-COVID, as I mentioned before, we've had some learning. So, you know, we're very pure about wanting to make every drop in Lynchburg, but we realize both from an environmental perspective, so you think about that, it's quite important now. Um, we have started shipping bulk whiskey uh, to cover Europe. So we have bottlers now in two different locations in Europe where we actually can bottle Jack Daniels, not for Woodford Reserve and Old Forester. So today still everything is made here and shipped from here, but you know, if it gets to a foreseeable size at some point, that would probably move in that direction as well. Yeah. So the Kentucky legislature just got rid of the barrel tax, which was a tax on bourbon that was in the barrel. The first time you put it in, they taxed you every year. Maybe one of you guys can tell us about that tax. And now that it's gone, what's the benefit to, to, um, to your industry. So Kentucky was the only state that had this tax for aging spirits in the United States. So it was five cents per every hundred dollars worth of bourbon that was put into the barrel. And you were taxed on the liquid that was put into the barrel and you were taxed every single year as that bourbon matured at the rate in which it's put in the barrel. For those of you who are familiar with the angel share, there is evaporation that occurs every year. So you might lose 5%, then 10%, 15 20%. And 10 years from now, you're still paying taxes on the full amount of liquid that you put in the barrel year one. Now, with Kentucky being the only state that does this, put Kentucky at a disadvantage versus other states that didn't have this barrel tax. And so what we were seeing is more and more distilleries maybe distilling their liquid here, but then taking it to other states, Indiana across the river, to do the aging to not have to pay that barrel tax. So just this week, it was huge news. The KDA, the Kentucky Distillers Association, is a great partner for the industry to help lobby with government officials. They were able to help us pass a removal of the barrel tax. Now this won't happen immediately, it will happen over the course of 20 years, but what that means is that that will be more dollars that suppliers and distillers can put back into investing in Kentucky. More rick houses, more distilleries, more brand home visitor ex expansions because they won't have that barrel tax, which was millions and millions of dollars across the industry. So big win uh, for the industry and I think it's, it's, it's gonna have positive repercussions to help continue to solidify bourbon as uh, Kentucky as the bourbon capital of the world. I'm just going to say we have over 3 million barrels in storage. <laughs> so yes. it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, there, what are some of the new innovations? In, are there any innovations in aging? I, I know there's some engineering students. I had a bourbon barrel. And they, bar, they borrowed it from me. I guess I'm not going to get it back. But, um, but they're trying to come up with some sort of engineering way to maybe age the bourbon more quickly. And if that technology came along, do you think people would say, oh, this is fine? Or would they revolt like they did when Woodford Reserve watered down their bourbon by like one or two percent? You wanna go, you wanna go? <laughs> I'll go. Um, I think the expression here is, um, well, why don't you go on? Let me, <laughs> let me get my thoughts back. I, I, let, let me go back about 10 years, if that's okay, first. So Woodford Reserve was one of the first that um, did something called cycling of barrels. And so if you go into our warehouses, so a, a, normal, a normal warehouse, okay, I'll just use in Kentucky anywhere, it gets hot in the summers and it's cold in the winters. And so the liquid, it goes in a lot into the barrel. That's where you get all your flavor. You get a lot, a lot of the texture, the color comes from the barrel itself. Well, in the summer, you're getting lots of aging, okay? And especially if you're up on a top floor, fifth, sixth story, it could be 115 degrees up there. It might be 60, 65 degrees on the first floor. What we did is we wanted to be able to make our aging process more efficient. So we started to actually steam, actually put steam into the warehouses at, in, at, at Woodford Reserve. So if you go in there now, it's a constant temperature all year round. And the reason is we wanted to be able to actually more scientifically measure the impact of the aging. It also lets you, frankly, if you want to speed up aging, you can do that. If you want to slow it down, you can do that. It's extremely expensive, by the way. I just want to say from an electricity perspective. But it, it gives us more control over that. And so that was one step. Um, you know, again, candidly, I'll say it's, it's something that we're considering doing down the road to other distilleries that we have. But today, if you go to Jack Daniels, it's still a metal warehouse. It is really hot in the summer and really, really cold in the winter. And so, 
it's something that when, that's why when you look at age statements on a bottle, and especially, and I'm sorry, I'm going off a tangent here, but if you take <coughs> a bottle of, of bourbon, let's say it's aged 10 years, and a bottle of scotch that's aged 10 years, you need to know more about how is it aged, where is it aged, what is the climate is it aged in. Kentucky is a hot, very humid climate, and so that's one of the reasons why you've seen American whiskeys and bourbon whiskeys do so well here is because of the way it interacts with the wood. But you need warm temperatures to be able to make that relationship with the barrel add on. So. Yeah, what I, what I wanted to say was it, regulation normally protects the consumer. So when, when things like this start popping up and say, hey, we can get the aging, not aged nine years, and we can do it in one year, the, the aspect and the growth of, of the industry is going towards premium products. When you're premium, when you're craft, when you're handmade, all these attributes is to protect the consumer. When you say, I can get it faster, it's, it's like a shortcut. And to be honest, what the growth that we see in, in this premiumization is towards that, that consumer base, not the, the cheap, fast, I'll get it for you ready tomorrow. That there might be a market, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's bad or indifferent, but, um, but really the regulation is to protect the consumer in a, in a product that is aged uh, like you were describing. It's a slow s summer, winters, extraction. It's a slow process that gets you to the quality that we want. Good. So I heard that some, some distilleries have RFID chips and that kind of monitor each of the barrels and what's happening in the barrels. Is, that, is there technologies like that that's growing a lot more? And will, will anything AI be helpful with anything? Do you guys have any idea? <laughs> We, we had AI earlier this semester as one of our talks, so. Yeah, we, we, we have RFID and, you know, and finished case products on, on every pallet of X number of cases, uh, kind of to track and protect, again, the consumer because there's some tax regulations uh, that one country might have higher taxation than another one. So you could see that a different country was buying it and then selling it to the other one. You know, there's always shortcuts for everything, right? Uh, so there's, there's technology on that to track, and it's RFID chips. Uh, on the maturing side, we, we do have uh, tags that have a chip in it, and we read at every stage of the process. So we know when there's an empty barrel, what product's going to go into it, when, at what time, what day exactly it was filled, when did it leave the sister room, which is where we fill the barrels, and when did it end up in a, in a warehouse? So we, we can track all of that um, information. And now, really, the, the most interesting thing is uh, data analytics. So we have a ton of data. It's how do we extract all of that and, and make actually uh, valuable decisions to, um, to use all that data. Well, let, let me cut in for a second. We do have an MSBA program, a Master's of Business Analytics. And this would be a great program to segue into the um, distilling industry because they do have a lot of data. Sorry to cut in, but got to do the advertisements, right? <laughs> uh, I'll add one more thing just on, and it's not so much on the maturation process, but you talk about RFID. You know, if, if you go to large parts of Africa, you go to Asia, you go to China, counterfeit's a big deal, all right? There is a, there's billions and billions of dollars of counterfeit alcohol that are made using our brands, Literally, they will get our bottles, or they'll make them, or they'll get our bottles, and they will try to repackage them as you know, an authentic product. Number one, it's illegal. Two, in many cases, the product that's actually going in that bottle can, can kill people, and it happens all the time. And so we have, as an industry, have been working to fight that, first working with governments to try to get them to enforce this. But one thing that we've done recently, and I'll just speak to, I had Africa before, um, we were starting to test in certain countries a special label that when we bottle, uh, it could be Woodford Reserve, and we put it on the Woodford bottle here in Kentucky, that it gets scanned here, it gets to our distributor who imports in the, in the country, so let's use Ivory Coast, that's one of the places we're doing that. It's scanned by our partner there who has taken possession of it. It's scanned again when it gets to the retail shop, okay? This is all being uploaded on the cloud, so we know where it is at all times. And what starts to happen is, and this has happened with many products, it, at this point, it's expired. The bottle, if you were to pull this tag off, it can never be put back on again. It's impossible, I shouldn't say impossible, it's impossible right now at least. If it's scanned a fourth time though, 
we will immediately be flagged that this bottle that was already scanned technically at the retail point of purchase, that somewhere else it's being scanned and it, we were able then to work with the local authorities to locate it. This has already happened about two years ago. We kicked it off in Ivory Coast. We're now expanding to Nigeria, to Kenya. We're gonna expand it, actually, well, we were going to expand it to Ukraine, uh, not right now. But my point is, is that we as an industry, this is one of the biggest problems. We look at organized crime, they use alcohol as a major industry to be able to try to fuel all the efforts that they have. And so technology is a good example. This is actually helping us being able to, to thwart, if you will, some of those efforts. But it's still pretty early stage from where it could be the next few years. OK. Um, I think I'm pretty much to ask out. So why don't we open this up to um, anybody in the audience have any questions? If not, I can come up with more. Oh, we've got, we've got microphones in the back, so if you would go to the back and ask, please. Microphones in the back. We're, we're recording this, so we need to get it recorded. Hey, good evening. Thank you all for being here. I'm Calvin Barker with Truist Bank, and one of the questions that uh, we, we do a lot of financing in the spirit space, and one of the questions we're continually asking is, you know, what's the trajectory? Where is it going, right? Where there's a lot, every day in the, or not every day, but about every week we see an announcement of a new distillery, new capacity expansion. So, you know, as you all are looking at your data, you know, in, if the distilleries are being built today, they'll be producing in two years, and the product will be eight years old in 10 years. So you've got to look pretty far out. So what do your projections tell you? Can all this capacity that's coming online be absorbed, or do you think there's trajectory even beyond that? And, and what's the keys to being able to absorb it? Who wants to start? I, I can start if you want. I mean, I, I'm going to take, if you don't mind, just because I'm, I'm not as close to the domestic trends anymore of the US, although I know they're still strong. Um, but I'll say it again, bourbon whiskey is extremely underdeveloped internationally. And so if you look at, and I'll just use a stat from, for Brown Foreman, our largest competitor for, was Johnny Walker Black Label. And Johnny Walker had a 50 year head start against our brand all over the world. Okay, so two generations of drinkers were drinking Scotch whiskey. They already had a palate for it. They were not into American whiskey as much. And so you look at that brand and 70% of its global sales was done in emerging markets. 18% of our global sales were done there. Now you look at where all the growth internationally is, emerging markets, China, India, et cetera, that's where all a, a big part of the growth is coming from, Africa as well. And we are working very hard as an industry to seed bourbon whiskey in particular to be able to build on that growth rates. And so will there be a potential bubble at times in different parts of the world, perhaps, but I think when you take it at a global level, so you think of all this aged whiskey that's sitting there, the demand is still, in my opinion at least, far exceeding what we currently have from a supply perspective. I think where it's a little unclear is we don't have a crystal ball on the exact parts of the world where that growth is going to continue to surge. And I'll use Russia as an example. I oversaw Russia. It was growing at 40% a year. And then we had to shut it down last year because of what happens. So like things happen that it's just very hard to predict around. But I think we've got a long runway at, at a global level ahead. So I think it's good we're going to continue to get more warehouses. And let, let me ask a question real quick. Mm -hmm. is, is the product you sell overseas, is it, is it uh, it, is it higher end stuff, lower end stuff, or mid range, or is it all everything? Um, you know, in developing countries, for example. I think it depends per market. So starting with our, our core bourbon line, but a lot of distilleries will release rest of the world exclusives. Um, and so I think that's certainly an opportunity for some of the higher end brands that that they have that room to do that. Yeah, I'd say for us. Uh, it's been mostly premium and above, so I'd say kind of at 20, think $25 a bottle and above on average. That's where a lot of the growth is. In fact, value-based spirits, including bourbon, by the way, is not projected to grow over the next 10 years. It's going down, actually. In fact, value spirits are going down. So when you look at the spirits industry, you look at bourbon whiskey, both US and internationally, it's all premium and above. And it, again, it goes down to, even in, I'll use India, 50% of the, of the entire world's whiskey is consumed in India, okay? So it is, and it's a 1.4 billion population growing about to surpass China next year as the largest country in the world. And they have a taste for premium and above, scotch, bourbon, Irish, you name it. And so, um, but it's not, it's not value. You know, this is, it's really, it's, it's really interesting, even in some of the lower economic areas where there's, you, a consumer would prefer not to drink and then try something that is more meaningful and has a special experience to them. 
than the way it was 30 or 40 years ago. So it's great for our, our companies and for the industry. For, for our brands, it's, it's mainly the flagship or Jim Beam White is what is uh, our truly global brand. Uh, all our premium other brands is, is a smaller volume. Uh, but yeah, we, we don't have enough to supply the world if there would be a, a growth or a continued growth. Uh, definitely the domestic market is the number one for us. Uh, Japan is our number two. And again, looking at demographics, um, look for premium end uh, products. But again, India and <laughs> Brazil and China, we wouldn't have enough bourbon to supply those, those markets right now. Hence, that's why a year ago we opened a, a, our craft distillery. Uh, we just announced another expansion uh, in our distilleries. Uh, because we see this trend, and we're looking at, at 12, 15 year, old, 15 year ahead uh, what we need to produce, and, and again, this is what uh, we're looking at. Um, in, under the premiumization, it, it needs to sit longer. <laughs> so we, we have all this capacity, and as all these um, new distilleries come online, we have that competitive advantage that we have the aged liquid. They're still working on that, and whenever they get that, we're going to be well suited to, to supply all this demand. OK, with uh, Kentucky finally jumping on the bandwagon as far as legalizing marijuana, are you guys worried about that cutting into your guys' profit? Yeah. I, I, I can tell. I mean, we did a study. So when, when, when Colorado, I think it was Colorado, maybe it was Washington, I forgot which states it was first 10 years ago. We did a two-year study on um, consumption patterns. And this is changing a bit, too, I'll say, as, as it becomes a bigger piece. But first off, beer is the biggest loser when it, when it comes from an alcohol perspective. When you look at kind of trade-off, beer is by far the biggest substitute, OK, for marijuana. Not to say wine and spirits are not. We have, it's still up in the air, I'll just say. It's still to be determined. But we have not seen an impact in our business in those states since marijuana has been legalized. Um, it does not mean it couldn't still happen, but it's, for us, we're frank, frankly still watching and learning a bit. But so far, it hasn't been nearly as bad as I think, I think we would have thought it would have been a few years ago from a Brown Foreman side. Yeah, for us, it was basically the same. There was an initial fear and um, study of, let's see what happens. But as different states start legalizing, and we haven't, we've seen the same data, uh, there's not been uh, major significance. <laughs> Probably Taco Bell's done better. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys for being here. This is really very informative. Appreciate you coming to tell us about bourbon. Um, and Robinson, I want to encourage you to get those people in Latin America. When they go down there three or four times a year, all they get is Jack Daniels. Could you get some of your other brands down there? <laughs> I'm on it. I'm on it. <laughs> now, they do have Jim Beam. They're just down there. But, uh, and, I, and we keep, you know, I went to a rum factory there, took a bunch of students, and they said that they were putting, they were putting the rum in the, in the bourbon barrels, and they said the bourbon was Jack Daniels, and these kids were from Kentucky. And they said, no, wait a minute. That's not bourbon. So. <laughs> but anyway. Um, I, I was curious about, I know, Lindsay, you mentioned earlier about some of the innovations, and one of those was the single barrel. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and, and you're right, I mean, it does taste different, and, and it's, it's a premium, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it does taste different, so you won't get that same, you know, I go out and buy that single barrel bottle, and then the next time I buy one, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. I might be disappointed, um, but since it is innovation, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure that's what you are, are after. I'm curious about, because as Robson, you said, you know, international market is really where you're going, because that's where all, the, where, where all the money is. Do you have to use the innovation that we would use here overseas, or can you still sort of rely on what you were doing before when you, when you take your product overseas? You have more experience with the international I'll pay piece. a compliment to Beam Suntory, if I can, for a minute. So when Suntory Holdings acquired Jim Beam, a bit, you know, Beam, Beam Holdings, um, Japan, obviously, is where their headquarters is. And the bourbon industry was in decline there. So let me start by saying that. It was a big, big business. But 
a trend that was really big in Japan that their company in particular jumped on was the highball. So it was a style of consumption that you weren't going to see necessarily in the US or in different parts of the world. And that has actually since then gone the op it's actually carried trends outside of Japan. So it hasn't always come out of the US. Um, but I would still say, at least for our company, most of the trends on um, consumption, like in terms of consumption patterns and, and ways of drinking alcohol, they're coming from the most, you know, the big London, New York City, San Francisco, Sao Paulo. They're, they're still coming from fairly well-developed cities, and then they're spreading. And what we're trying to do is learn from those trends and make sure that we can <coughs> capitalize on it. So, Yeah, definitely the number one market is the US. And, and this is where we have that expression of single barrel. And I understand your disappointment. So if, if you like a bottle, make sure you go back and buy all of them from the same batch. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I'm interested in what your U of L MBA has done for you in the distilled spirits industry. And did any of you get the distilled spirits certificate that we offer here? We didn't have it. Yeah, we didn't have it. I graduated in uh, 2010, so it wasn't uh, available at that point. But uh, in terms of setting me up for my entire career, I think just the strategic thinking um, and the, the way that the classes were set up in such a way that I went through working with a cohort. So I did the professional Saturday MBA program. I was with the same cohort throughout the entire two-year program, working on all of our projects together, um, working with a team, different cross-functions, different industries was incredible experience seeing different perspectives brought to the table of how we tackle a problem. Um, I think another big piece of it was we had real life capstone projects where we worked with companies within Louisville to help solve a problem. Uh, interestingly enough, my capstone project was with Brown Foreman. Uh, back in 2010, they said, these ready to drink cocktails are huge internationally, but it seems like the United States consumers just aren't ready for that. So what can we do to help capitalize and bring the success that we've seen in Australia and, and Europe to the United States? And so it was great to be able to do that real life work and have that experience with my cohort working directly with a corporation presenting to them uh, and interestingly enough we were talking earlier uh, when that segment blew up a few years ago we, we kind of laughed about it and said it well it was only a matter of time we knew it was coming when we were doing that research but they just weren't quite ready yet so uh, can't say enough good things about the program and, and how it has shaped me and to be uh, a leader that's now thinking more strategically about how we set our company up for success in the future yeah, <clears throat> to me, I did the, the executive MBA in joint partnership with UK U of L. So I guess I got the best of both um, in that experience. I have 15 years in, in the industry, so a lot of the, a lot of the classes uh, helped me ratify like travel knowledge that I got through those years. So it was like, oh yeah, I knew a little bit about that, but I didn't have the full concept of it. So the classes actually helped me to solidify that, that knowledge I had, that travel knowledge, or I learned it the hard way, <laughs> um, and then just getting the textbook uh, um, version of it and just the, the full view of it. So I agree with the strategic thinking, the costing, and, and all of that was tremendous uh, value to me. Yeah, I, I went through the entrepreneurial MBA program, so I graduated in 2007, uh, IMBA, and I have to say, boy, it, it was, a huge, huge help for my career journey. So for me, uh, most of my last 15 years have been either with startup brands or startup countries for our, our, our Brown Foreman business. And the experience for that two years was incredible, especially the second year. We, our class, like our cohort, you know, we had a business plan project that you got to do in year two. And so in my case, myself and three or four others started actually an alcohol brand. We actually started a spirits brand, had it created, had a, uh, the liquid actually created, bottled, uh, we got uh, we got the chance because of U of L to travel around to different uh, universities and compete in business plan competitions. Went through the whole process, actually won a couple of them, which was very nice. Got some money from that that helped to get some seed capital to move forward. And so, um, while I was at Brown Foreman and was not intending to leave the company, the rest of my of my cohort they quit their jobs and did it full time. And um, it was an incredible learning experience for us. And I've used this regularly in the last last ten to fifteen years, especially. Um, you all talked about how like you had premium bourbon and that's coming the future of people buying it and tasting it and all that stuff. 
I was kind of curious what you thought about the investment side and people collecting bourbon and how that kind of rolls into your future of making bourbon. So. Yeah, uh, bourbon collecting is has certainly taken off in recent years. Um, you've got people on both sides of it, people who are frustrated because they want to walk into the store and pay retail for the bourbon that they've got their eye on. but everyone scoops it up and wants to sell it higher price secondary market so it certainly causes frustration amongst bourbon lovers who are out there really looking for something special um, but i think it's probably not going away uh, that's that's a trend because of the premiumization that that we've talked about throughout the day that people are looking for not only that ultra premium or high quality product but they want something unique they want to be able to share this special bottle that they found with their friends and their family. Um, so I, I, I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. There are a number of limited edition releases that all of our companies come out with every year uh, that are highly sought after, and I'm sure that's going to continue. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think it's great that uh, people are wanting. Um, there's a demand for it, and on the marketing side, you know, it's sought after and people want it and they'll do, they, they'll stand in line to get those products. So it's creating all of this uh, craze about this release or this product um, that again, sometimes it's limited time offers. There's not enough liquid to support it. So it's just an expression of, all right, let's release X amount of cases. And, and then it creates all of this momentum, which is great for the industry, but I agree sometimes it might be frustrating for for some other people that can't get their hands on it. Yeah, hang on to them if you can get them. <laughs> um, I have a question, why Kentucky? And uh, what other things besides the 5% barrel tax would make it vulnerable for, you, for Kentucky to lose the business of bourbon? I mean, you opened, the, you opened with 95% of bourbon is here mm -hmm. in yep. Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And my question, why Kentucky? Yeah. What makes it special here? Yeah. And the, the follow-up question is, what makes us vulnerable to lose it? Yeah, I think there are a number of things that make Kentucky the perfect place for bourbon. So bourbon, by law, has to be at least 51% corn. Kentucky is a great state for growing corn. I think around 75% of the Kentucky bourbons source their corn directly from Kentucky, which is great. Um, the climate, as we've talked about, in order to really embark, impart those flavors into the liquid, you need that climate that is very hot summers, very cold winters, so that the liquid can go in and out of the barrel and really get those flavors uh, developed over the years. Also, limestone water is plentiful here in Kentucky, and it's, it's the most perfect pure water that can go into a bourbon, and so that's a huge advantage for us. Am I missing anything? I, f I feel like there's so many things that make Kentucky special. You hit it, you hit it pretty well. I yeah. think I'd say the vulnerability of Kentucky, I don't, I, don't, I mean, this, this actually, this, this act to, to remove this barrel tax is a great step forward. I mean, look, I, I would not be concerned about Kentucky not continuing to be the, the dominant place where, where bourbon was founded and where its history is. If I can step out of Kentucky for a minute, though, and, and just say this, that you, know, you can get technically bourbon whiskey brands in almost any state in the US now, right? Especially Texas, Colorado, Pennsylvania, et cetera. But when people hear the word bourbon, they think Kentucky, and for a reason, because the largest companies are based here, um, the oldest brands are based here, all the history is here. I don't think it's a bad thing to see other states innovate a bit and play with this, but at the end of the day, where's the bourbon trail? It's in Kentucky. Look at what's happened in the last 15 to 20 years. All the tourism that's coming in. Uh, and I'm not knocking any of our competitors in other states. Those are great to have. But bourbon, the home place of bourbon is right here. It's in Louisville. It's in Bardstown. It's in Lexington. And it has become an international icon. People I have met all over the world, it is a bucket list for them to come here to this city and to this state and to go through that experience. And it's only going to increase in the years to come. Question, just on the marketing side of things, can you all talk to the importance of social media, influencers, as you all look to grow among Gen Zers who are turning 21 or even like, you know, younger or older millennials and anything unique your brands do um, on the influencer or social side? I think we're, we're still a young brand. We're about 12 years old. 
Um, up until last year, we were selling every drop of liquid we've ever made as we talk about the, the production process, right, and how long it takes for your product to mature. Um, so we're just now coming off all allocation, which is great. We have plentiful liquid. Um, and so from a marketing standpoint, we're very young in terms of what our social media uh, strategy is and, and using influencers, things to that nature. Um, so you all might be better suited to, to speak to what your companies are doing there. I, I can add, we don't, uh, going back 20 years ago to now, if you looked at the percent of our overall marketing budget that was spent in the digital space, actually even 10 years ago to now, it went from being maybe 5% to it's probably close to 60% of our overall budget. And it's not to take away from you know out of home billboards and, and TV, but that's that has become a very minuscule component. But what's interesting is the uh, capabilities of marketers. See, we had a lot of very seasoned marketing executives at Brown Foreman who didn't understand the space at all. And so we have, and we mentioned digital transformation, we, we've been going through that over the last four to five years. We did a self-assessment, a self and it was a survey that compared our capabilities on digital, just in general, at Brown Foreman, and then it was benchmarked against compares like Diageo, Kraft, um, or Mondelez, a bunch of other companies, and honestly, we were we were way behind. We just updated that that assessment, and it's because we've hired hundreds of new marketers who've come in with this capability and this new muscle. And also, we've been on a journey for our existing marketers to learn the space because it's the future. But I'll be frank; it is even for me. I've gone through it myself. It has been a huge journey. We don't use influencers. I will say nothing against influencers, by the way. It's just we're pretty particular about um, a lot of brands do, and that's fine. We would prefer to have organic people who are involved, who, are, who love our brand and are making posts, but we get really nervous about influencers sometimes because they may make posts or do things that are a bit contrary to the way that we'd like the brand to be perceived. And so we're probably in the minority on that of, of most companies, to be honest, but we know it's a very important part of brand advocacy and, and getting people that come behind a brand. Yeah, one, one small ad there, again, it's, it's digital transformation. It's web pages dedicated to the brand and to the product and releases and everything. And just say that uh, before Brand House didn't, didn't really have uh, that social media, someone that is actually reading it or uh, taking care of it in, in, in a cohesive, integrated way. And now we have a full team. <laughs> that there's like five, eight people like uh, in the brand house just dedicated for digital transformation. Emily Reed. <laughs> I'm in his reading group. He knows I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, so my name is Emily. I'm a sustainability major. And you've kind of talked about sustainability some, but I was wondering if you all could like give us any more thoughts or input or expectations with it. Specifically, uh, while you were talking, I wrote down three things about uh, with the glass shortage, did you all ever consider uh, recollecting and reusing old bottles or uh, getting a certain percentage from recycled? Uh, for the person that was talking about the quicker aging time that takes a lot of electricity, here in Kentucky we have a lot of rivers that could be great for hydropower. And for the one that was talking about uh, making a forest just full of white oak trees, or do you know if anybody in your business is worried about possibly some type of like disease or fungus coming through? Like what would ha like what is happening with the hemlock woody, woolly adeldred, or what happened 100 years ago with the American hemlock tree? But yeah, sustainability. She's <laughs> <laughs> worried. Yeah, that's good. That's a good question. <laughs> I'll take a little bit of, of that question. Uh, <laughs> So we, we, our company, Beam Centauri, has a proof positive initiative uh, that, is, again, just like the digital transformation, it's a new, um, there's a lot of people working on it. Uh, so this proof positive is proof environment, proof uh, consumer, and, and society or community. Uh, but talking about you know, the trees, I don't, I'm not very familiar on diseases or anything, but I can tell you that just last Monday, uh, we had a lot of our team members that went tree planting. Uh, so that's some of the things that we do to give back uh, to the community. And again, on the sustainability, on this proof positive uh, initiative. Um, with the glass shortage, we don't, we don't recycle those bottles or try to refill. Yeah, we work with our uh, glass supplier and we increase uh, our, our level of recycled materials. So we're doing all of that, looking at cardboard, and, and I, again, it's not my area of expertise, but 
looking at total weight of, of dry goods and, and reducing that year over year is part of this initiative uh, that we're looking to increase uh, recycle percentage of materials and also reducing the amount of materials we use for packaging. I'll say specific to trees, as we talked about how long it takes for an oak tree to mature and you only get three or four barrels from that oak tree. This was something that we recognized years ago when the brand started. And so now we are in year 10 of a tentpole program that we call Toast the Trees. And this directly, we work with trade and consumers on helping to protect the future of bourbon to ensure that we have enough barrels to continue to make our wonderful liquid in years to come. So every September during Bourbon Heritage Month, we lead this Toast of the Trees program. And with, through consumer engagement, uh, we, we do hashtags and ways for them to participate and, and feel like they have a part in that and planting new white oak trees uh, within Kentucky and across the Midwest to help uh, protect the future of bourbon and ensure that we have barrels for the future. Yeah, I can add, we've, so as I mentioned before, we, we own our own cooperage. We've actually had a cooperage since the 1940s. So we've got, uh, we have a, something called the White Oak Initiative that isn't just ours, we work with other partners on this, but um, since we buy directly, we literally work with the forest, like with the Ozarks and different areas of the U.S. to buy the wood to have our barrels made. And we've been doing this for probably 15 years now. We are replanting with them, with each tree that goes down effectively. And we're doing it for the whole industry. We know that every 25 years, it's going to take at least that long to have a tree ready to be able to be harvested. And so this has been something that I think it's more of an industry-wide initiative. But since we are actually directly selling barrels to even our competitors, we are making sure that we're working with them to ensure that there's a sustainable forest that's going to continue to be able to provide the barrels and also protect the, uh, the uh, landscape there. So. so there are 10.3 million barrels stored in Kentucky. We have a population of 4.51 million. So it's about two barrels per person or 400 bottles per person. <laughs> so do your part and make it 3.99 by going out and buy some, buying some bourbon. But we, we need to finish up here. So I want to thank Lindsay and Ricardo and Robinson for a great talk. And I've got a little gift for you somewhere here. And a bottle of bourbon? No. <laughs> Let me see, Ricardo. Anyhow, so let's thank these guys. Thank Give them a big round of applause.